So uh, my name is Peter Fernandez. Thank you very much for uh, the very kind introduction from, from Leo and the uh, invitation to, to speak today. Um, Desmond asked me to, to talk on what causes sarcoidosis. And um, since he's not here, I, I can slightly uh, confess to this being probably a very difficult topic to answer, um, but I'll try my best. Um, fine. So, uh, to, oh, oh, uh, so to start with, so um, it's traditional to put in whether you're paid by anyone else apart from the NHS, and, and I am not, so I don't have any commercial disclosures to mention. Um, I'll crack straight on. So I, I'm going to talk about sarcoidosis itself rather than neurosarcoidosis. Uh, we don't really know what causes either. So in some ways, they're interchangeable in terms of the answer to that question. But I'm going to restrict myself to, to, to sarcoidosis as a whole rather than just talk about neurosarcoidosis, if that's OK. Um, and, and the short answer is very quick, which is we don't know. Um, and I think most of you will understand that already um, because you know, there's a lot of questions about sarcoidosis and a lot of answers still to be found. And we're working on that. Um, but I think it's fair to say that at the moment, if you had a truthful answer to the question, what causes sarcoidosis? The answer we don't know would be pretty accurate. But that would be quite a short talk. Um, so I'm going to keep going and I'll give you a longer answer. So the longer answer, that's a picture of a long jump. Sorry, I couldn't find a, a, a good picture for longer, um, is we really don't know but we do have some ideas. So I'm gonna talk about the ideas we have um, in terms of what we think the causes are. So um, it, when, you, when you have this problem, when you have a, a, a disease, a disorder that you don't know the cause of, you have to try and look for clues. Um, and there's really uh, there's quite a few ways you do this, but I think in, in the main, there's three main ways, which is firstly, are there any similar diseases? You know, diseases look very, very almost you know, identical and you could say well it's probably likely to be related to that disease in some way the second way you could think about it is well perhaps we can get a clue from the way we treat the disease so if we, if we know what drugs work for sarcoidosis and we know how those drugs work and that gives us a clue into what sort of disorder sarcoidosis is and the third method um, which is a little bit uh, more content more contentious really is um, epidemiology so who gets sarcoid and does that give us any clues and that's more tricky in terms of a, uh, a, a technique, but I, I will, I'll go on to that. Um, so I'll start with the first one. So are there any similar diseases? So just a, a recap, I suspect many of you will be familiar with this, but sarcoidosis is characterized by granulomas. And what granulomas are, are collections essentially of immune cells that wall off um, a, 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 the inside of, of, of that collection. It's very small, you have to use a microscope to see it. And you can divide them into two types. And the, the first type is the one on the top, um, top left, um, which has a center that is alive, okay? And the bottom type is a center where that, the, the, what's in the middle is, is essentially dead. There's nothing alive there in terms of cells, okay? Um, so there's two types of granulomas. And in sarcoid, we see the first type where the inside is, is alive as opposed to the second type where the inside is dead. And rather charmingly, um, the way the pathologists, the, uh, the doctors who look at tissues have named these is, is caseating for, for dead and non-caseating for alive. And, and caseating means cheesy. So if you have, it, luckily in the group, we're the non-cheesy type of granulomas, which is a better way of uh, naming it, I think. And, and the picture on the right is just to illustrate that really sarcoid can affect any part of the body um, almost completely. I, was, I, I think it was uh, John Zajcek told me once that uh, he didn't think the adrenals were affected, but having looked it up, you can certainly get adrenal sarcoid. Um, so I have to say, I think I think it's, I can't think of a single path of what it isn't affected. So what we're looking for really is a disease that causes granulomas that can affect any part of the body. So what diseases do we know that are like that? Um, well, in terms of the, the, we'll start with the cheesy forms, I know they're different, uh, but cheesy forms are generally infections. So things like TB or fungus or parasites. Now we don't get much parasites in this country, um, that's more elsewhere. We don't get much fungal disease actually in this country either, but we do see a bit of TB, more in other countries, but a bit of TB here. And there's always been that question mark about whether sarcoid is related to TB in some way, but the granulomas are actually different in TB. So what about the non-cheesy granulomas, the ones that are, we're interested in in sarcoid? Well, the causes of that are number one are autoimmune diseases, and those include uh, what we call vasculitis, so inflammation of blood vessels, um, 
Crohn's disease, which typically is just the GI tract, so the stomach and the intestines and sometimes the mouth as well. And, uh, and then you get the second type, which is really foreign body reaction. So you have something in your body that's not supposed to be there, that isn't alive, but your body has a particular reaction to that. And viriosis, which is it's a, a very pretty mineral actually, um, used as a gemstone. So we know that people who mine gemstones who have exposure to viriosis dust get this disease, particularly in the lungs, but it can be elsewhere in the body. Uh, which looks relatively similar to sarcoid under the microscope, although often if you look really carefully, you can see uh, the, the mineral inside the granuloma. And you can also get foreign body reactions. So if, if someone uh, cuts you open and leaves a, a suture inside you that doesn't dissolve, then sometimes you can get a granuloma around that. Okay, but that's usually in one place only, of course, it's not spread throughout the body. And then various drugs can cause uh, uh, granulomas, um, typically immune system drugs. So some of the HIV drugs, um, some of the immune system drugs, like immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are used for cancer treatment. Uh, we, we can see sarcoid-like granulomas in those too. And lastly, infection. So often you get non-cheesy granulomas alongside cheesy granulomas and infections, but typically you will see the cheesy ones. Um, so I've said, talk too much about cheese. So I'm going to move on to um, the second point, which is, well, if we know a little bit about what sarcoid looks like and other disease, uh, the granulomas look like in other diseases, Maybe we should move on to how we treat sarcoid. And I think most of you will be familiar with many of these medications um, that we use for treating sarcoid. So uh, prednisolone, methotrexate, mycophenolate, and infliximab. And, and that although they don't, they have significant side effects and they don't work for everyone, I think it's fair to say that there is significant benefit for many people on these treatments, which is really helpful because it tells us that these treatments are doing something against what probably the cause of sarcoid is. Um, and what are they doing? Well, they are all suppressing the immune system to some degree. And if they're suppressing the immune system that helps sarcoid, then the clue that gives us is that sarcoid is a disease mediated in some way by the immune system. So it's an autoimmune disease of some form. It doesn't take us a huge amount forward because there's lots of causes in autoimmune diseases. And in fact, for most of them, we don't really know what the underlying cause is, but it's helpful nonetheless that we think this is more likely to be an autoimmune disease than an infectious disease, that makes sense. It's unlikely to be something like TB or causing sarcoid uh, or active TB causing sarcoid, because if it was, and you gave someone immunosuppression like these treatments, then it would get a lot worse rather than a lot better. Okay. So I'm going to move on to uh, the third point, which is how can we use epidemiology? So who gets sarcoid? Try and give us some clues. And this is really difficult to do well, actually. Um, so sometimes it's, it seems like it's pretty obvious. So this is this is a graph um, of cigarettes versus lung cancer deaths. And you can see they match each other pretty well with a bit of lag. So you could clearly you know, work out from that that it's likely that cigarettes cause lung cancer. And, and of course, you'd be right to say that. Um, but the problem is, of course, is that you might get mixed up. You might say, well, unless you knew any better, that perhaps people who get lung cancer smoking helps them feel better when they have lung cancer. So you'd actually say that lung cancer causes smoking. Of course, you'd be wrong to say that, but you could think that's what's called reverse causation. So you need to make sure you're not getting things mixed up um, in terms of A, for, A to B rather than B to A, if that makes sense. And the second thing you need to be careful about is that link between association and causation. So just because two things go together doesn't mean that one causes another. And this graph, uh, which I, I really like, just shows that. So this is a graph comparing how much cheese, sorry, I'd come back to cheese. I promised I wouldn't, but I have. How much cheese people in America eat compared to the number of people who died by getting tangled up in their bed sheets. And you would think, and I think you'd be right to think, that those things are not related at all. But if you look at the graph, it's pretty close, isn't it? And that's just coincidence. That's just pure coincidence that those things are going together because there can't be any link, at least I can't think of any link between how much cheese people eat and how many people die in their bed sheets. But you need to be, you can see what I mean from this, you need to be careful about saying these two things go together, they, therefore they must be causing each other, because it's not always the case. So with those kind of caveats, with those warnings, let's move on and look at what we know about sarcoid. So we'll start with geography. So this is a map of, of who gets sarcoid. And uh, the, the darker blue it is, is the more common it is and the, the lighter blue, the less common it is, and grey is, we really don't know because no one's looked at it. And you can see most of the world is grey, and that's because we really don't know how many people in 
for example, Africa or South America or much of Asia, get sarcoid. And even when we do know, we're probably wrong because sarcoid is very difficult to diagnose. And often people say, I think it's sarcoid and it's not, or they might say, I think it's TB and it's actually sarcoid or the other way around. But I think what this graph shows us is it's most common in the Americas, so uh, the USA and uh, Canada, and in Northern Europe. So Scandinavia particularly, Britain, and then uh, slightly less common as, as you go towards the Mediterranean. What is interesting, I think, is that if you look at the Far East, so very rich countries like Japan and Korea, they don't really seem to get much sarcoid. So that's, I think that's useful to say, well, we think it's mostly a Northern European and American, as far as we can tell, but Far East seems to be relatively protected for what it's worth, okay? I think that ties into ethnicity as well, because obviously they're linked to geography and ethnicity. And what we typically see is that um, in America, it seems to be black Americans, who get Afro-Caribbeans particularly, who are more likely to get sarcoid, whereas in uh, in Europe, it tends to be more people from Northern European uh, backgrounds, particularly Scandinavian, who seem to be a bit more likely. I have to be honest with you, the studies are a little bit conflicting, um, but I think in general, it's from an ethnic ethnicity point of view, people of uh, black heritage or Northern European heritage seem to be at slightly higher risk um, than people from other ethnic backgrounds. Although of course, everyone has a risk to some degree. Moving on to uh, sex and gender. Um, so again, quite conflicting, depends on what study you read in terms of who gets it. But I think most studies would agree that women have a slightly higher risk of getting sarcoid than men. It's not hugely high. So we'd say probably about uh, 1.5 times. So women, there's you know 1.5 times risk in women compared to men. Again, it depends on what study you read. Um, and that fits in with most autoimmune diseases. So most autoimmune diseases, MS, for example, are more likely to affect women than men because of the way the immune system is slightly different in men and women. So that that's, an, I guess, added support uh, to it being an autoimmune disease. And let's go into to genetics. So genetics is really interesting because it gives us really loads of clues. So we know that if you have sarcoid, you're quite, you, you, it's not unusual to have a family member with sarcoid as well. So we think about five to 10% of people with sarcoid will have a family member with sarcoid as well. And um, if you identical twin, um, then your risk is much, much higher. So it's about 80 times higher than background population risk if you have an identical twin. If you have a non-identical twin, so that's Scarlett Johansson and her and her brother, um, who are clearly non-identical twins since they're different sexes. Um, and their risk is about seven times higher if you have a, a, a non-identical twin with, with sarcoid. A sibling alone is about five times, so a bit less. Um, and parent is about four times, okay? So that's a bit tricky though, because you know that if you grow up in the same environment as someone else, then it's likely you're exposed to the same infections, the same environmental exposures, the same kind of mud and other, you know, environmental uh, issues, uh, same water supply. So it's difficult to disentangle genetics from, you know, how you're brought up. But I think there is a difference between identical twins and non-identical twins and that really does show us that uh, there is a clear contribution from genetics here. And just so you know, so, so spouses, so the bottom right there, that Lego figure of the, uh, the, the, the groom and his bride, you actually are protected to some degree. So we think the spousal risk is about 0.2 times the risk. Um, so if you are a husband or wife or partner of someone with sarcoid, your risk is actually seems to be a bit lower. Um, I don't know how to explain that, so don't ask me how, but uh, that's an interesting fact nonetheless. Uh, other possible factors, and I put possible uh, in uh, well, uh, underlined, but it should be bold, italics and underlined, really, because we really don't know. Um, there's always been this question about whether TB is involved, and that's because TB looks quite similar. It's a granulomatous disease that affects all parts of the body. And there is some evidence for that in that um, when you take granulomas and you really look carefully at them, you can see there's some evidence of some TB proteins in that. What is clear is that the there's no TB there. So the TB it may be that people have been exposed to TB and then that's been cleared by the immune system, but there's a little bit of the immune system being kind of activated in some way that uh, it, it finds it difficult to deactivate even when the TB is gone. That's quite contentious, it's still argued about, but I think it, it's uh, an interesting theory nonetheless with some evidence. Um, there's some evidence that um, if uh, people who are overweight are slightly more likely to get sarcoid, uh, but I think that's very debatable. And a third area, which I think many, many people are interested in is, whether parts of the environment are making it more likely to develop sarcoid. Is there something in the environment 
that triggers Sarkid in some way. And people look really carefully, it's really difficult to study that. It's always been this theory that exposure to um, certain, you know, uh, certain professions, so particularly being in agriculture, um, and sometimes we think that type, um, you know, uh, water supplies, if they aren't filtered properly, is a link, but it's very arguable and, and very debatable, including for most of us in the UK, that is an issue too, because we all get our water from Maine's water. But it's, it's a theory, particularly in Canada, I think, is, is where this came out of. And then exposure to metal dust because of this buriosis, the, uh, the, the mineral I talked about before, um, and it's thought maybe that triggers it. It's quite difficult, though, because if you're exposed to metal dust, you tend to have lots of x-rays done because of lung disease, not sarcoid, but lung disease. And when you get lots of x-rays done, we pick up more sarcoid than if you don't have x-rays done. Um, so it's difficult to know whether that's actually true or not. It does seem to be a slightly higher rate in uh, the firefighters of 9-11 who are obviously exposed to loads of different chemicals. But again, we don't really know. Um, but some theories need more work. I'm not entirely convinced, to be honest with you. Um, but things will become more evident over time. And just my last slide then, in terms of a summary of what causes sarcoid. So I think we've got evidence to suggest it's an autoimmune disease. It's probably triggered, possibly triggered by an infection, but we don't know what infection. We don't think it's an ongoing infection, but right at the start, perhaps. And it may be that people have an environmental exposure in addition. What that is, we don't know. And it seems to be more likely people have a high genetic risk, but we don't know what genes are involved. And I'll leave you with a quote from, this is the earliest possible uh, paper on Sarkin I can find on the uh, on the internet. And it's uh, from 1938, British Medical Journal. And I won't read out the whole paper because it's very long, but I'll just, I'll just put one sentence, I think it was really helpful, which says, an acrimonious dispute over the nature of sarcoidosis has been in progress for many years. I have to be honest with you, I think it's still in progress now, nearly 100 years later. So uh, thanks very much for listening. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to take questions now, I think we're going to do that at the end, um, but uh, I'll hand over now. Thank you.